I think everyone knows by now that Garner Ted Armstrong died last week and was buried Thursday afternoon not far from Gladewater. You can't just pass over the passing of a man like Garner Ted Armstrong because he lies directly in the path of the lineage of this church even and of my ministry. I first met Ted Armstrong in 1958. I was a freshman in Ambassador College. I was 24 and he was 28. He was a faculty member at that time and he was also doing most of the radio program, uh, The Moral Tomorrow. I think his father in that time was doing the Sunday programs and he was doing the daily program most of the time. He was young, good looking, extremely knowledgeable of the Bible for a man his age. All of us who attended Ambassador College in those days were very intense in our Bible study. It was one of the true values we went there to regain. And anyone who went to college in those days spent a great deal of time in reading through the Bible, marking his Bible, studying his Bible, searching for different things, running through the concordances, chasing down ideas. Because a lot of the things that later generations found and took for granted in terms of the beliefs of the church, which were in literature, at that time were not. And so it was necessary that you had to go through and search all of them out for yourself, dig them out, because otherwise there was no particular place to find them. I began to become personally acquainted with Ted three years later after an illness sent me back to college to recuperate. I was a minister by then, and Ted and his cronies needed a fourth for card games, and I seemed to be the fellow that they liked to tap for the fourth for their card games. I was elected, and so I began to become much more acquainted with him. We became friends over the years that followed, and while I was in England uh, and he'd come over on a trip, he would always seek out Allie and I, and we would go to dinner someplace and, of course, chat for hours on end about different things. In 1969, he brought me back from England to Pasadena to act as his assistant in the foreign work. Now, over all the foreign offices, and I was later made vice president, not very much later, was made uh, vice president over that field. And from that time forward, really, from the time I came back from England, he and I became very, very close friends. There have been those who uh, have wondered about Ted over the years. They've wondered about his sincerity. They've wondered about his conversion. I never did. Because I had firsthand knowledge of his acquaintance with the Bible, of his belief in the Bible, of his belief in Jesus Christ, because of the hours and hours that I had talked with him. For one thing, I've seen his personal Bible, which was worn out from study, well marked, cross referenced, uh, worn down to where it would almost barely hold together, frankly, from to drag it up and use it in a sermon. But apart from that, I also knew it from endless conversations of every kind over, over every manner of beverage from coffee to beer to what have you. Meals in every kind of place from Quaglino's restaurant in London to the Criterion in Johannesburg in South Africa to a bowl of chili that he had made himself, venison chili in hunting camp. We, I knew about it from conversations in a bass boat, conversations in a cockpit of an airplane, and conversations in the cab of his pickup truck. Ted Armstrong knew the Bible as well as any man I have ever known. And he was converted, he had the Holy Spirit, and he was gifted of God. I have little doubt that he grieved the Holy Spirit on occasions in his life. I know he certainly grieved me more than once. But I never stopped loving him, and since God is a whole lot greater than I am, I am certain that God did not stop loving him either. I think there were times in his life when he did positive harm. That said, he still managed to turn the hearts of no small number of people to Jesus Christ. He did not do that by his person. He did it by pointing people to the Bible and to Jesus Christ. His book, The Real Jesus, was easily his most requested work. And as far in my opinion, I think it was the best thing that he ever did. If I start walking back down my path to find my spiritual roots, I am bound to stumble over Garner Ted Armstrong on the way back to wherever I came from. He was my friend. I will miss him. I'm sorry he is gone. And I'm terribly sorry for his wife, Shirley, and for his family. I know they must be hurting terribly by now. And it's so hard to realize that a man of that stature is now gone. There is no such thing as an indispensable man. Who do you think was the greatest prophet of God in his own day? 
Not necessarily now the greatest in the Bible, but I mean the greatest one in his own day. I think temptation would lead us to say Elijah, because certainly he is the archetype of the prophets as we find them down through time. But I wouldn't say so that he was the greatest in his day because there was a man who came right after him who had a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And he's got to be, you know, in his day, in his time, in his way, greater than Elijah. And he's a man very much worth studying. His name is Elisha. But even Elisha was not the indispensable man. In 2 Kings chapter 13, in verse 14, you may have heard the scripture quoted once in a while because of people worry about people who get sick and we pray for them and they die. It says in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 14, Now Elisha was fallen sick of the sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Joash, different man from some of the kings that had preceded, a different man from Ahab, to say the very least. And he was very, very concerned because of the love that he had, not for Elisha. But not only that, this expression, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. The chariot of Israel and the horsemen there is in a positive, if you know your grammar, to my father. It's another way of addressing him, the t- another title, if you want to say this, for Elisha. It was only this morning, for some reason, that finally dawned on me. I had read that countless times, and this is the first time this morning it ever really hit me. Chariots and horses were the armored cavalry of the day. And the last thing Joash ever wanted to do was to go to battle without Elisha. He was the armored cavalry. He was the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. He was the winner. He was the one that made the difference in whether they were going to win or whether they were going to lose. When you read the whole story of Elisha, I think you'll begin to understand why. Elisha was their secret weapon. Elisha said to him, take a bow and arrows. He took him a bow and arrows. He said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. And he put his hand on it. And Elisha put his hands on the king's hand. And he said, open the window to the east. And he opened it. And Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. and, And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance, the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for you shall smite the Syrians at Aphek until you have consumed them. Ah, so he came in, notice, concerned about the loss of their secret weapon. And he says, okay, here's what we're going to do regarding the king of Assyria. Shoot the arrow. He shot it. He said, "He said you're going to win. You're going to smite the Assyrians in Aphek. Then he said, take the arrows. And he took the rest of them. And he said, smite on the ground. And he smote three times and stopped. The man of God was furious with him, and he said, You should have smitten five or six times. Then you should have, would have smitten Syria till you had consumed it. Now you shall smite Syria but three times. And Elisha died, and they buried him. He was not the indispensable man. And we always look at this. It's worth noticing. And often I remember in college, it was given little sermonettes here and there or speeches in, in, in ambassador club. People would use this example of diligence, of zeal, of whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Because his, his negligence, his carelessness, his simply carrying this out instead of really doing it, that one thing made the difference in whether or not Syria would continue as a people or whether or not Israel would destroy them and dominate the region for generations to come. It's an interesting illustration. The bands of the Moabites invading the land later came in at the coming of the year. And it came to pass, they were burying a man, and they spied a band of men, and they cast this this body they were carrying into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down, he touched the bones of Elisha and came back to life and stood up. I mean, I I read that, and I wonder, what on earth is going on here? It it seems as though this man of God had so much of the power of God in him that it was residual in his bones like so much radiation. It's incredible to think about the, the power. And yet, this man was not indispensable. John the Baptist was a great man. Jesus had something very surprising in a way to say about John. You'll find it in Luke 7, verse 24. Luke 7, verse 24. When the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak to the people concerning John. What did you think you were going to see when you went out in the wilderness to see John? You heard about him. You went out there. Everybody's talking about John the Baptist. When you went out there, what did you go out there to see? A reed shaken with the wind? 
Come on, why did you go out there to see a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, look, they that are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's court. No, 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 what did you go out there to see? Well, somebody around him may have said, oh, well, we ought to see a prophet. And Jesus says, a prophet? Yes, and I say unto you, much more than a prophet. Now, <laughs> you kind of wonder in a way, how can you be more than a prophet? You know, God speaks to you. God tells you what to do. You go do it. That's a pretty great man. No, no, no. More than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, which shall prepare your way before you. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there has not risen, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than that. What do you make of that? Jesus said, among those who are born of women, well, that's, you know, we got the picture of what he means by that. There has not risen anybody greater than John the Baptist. Nevertheless, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Now, I don't know how he means us to take that regarding he himself, who we obviously know was greater than John, whom John knew Jesus was greater than he was, and Jesus was born of woman, yes, but he's obviously the exception to what we're talking about here. But John the Baptist was the greatest, greater than any prophet had ever been lived. And yet, in spite of this greatness, in spite of all that he was, was he the indispensable man? Well, the story is told in Mark chapter 6, Mark 6 and verse 14. King Herod heard about John the Baptist because everybody heard, what Je I mean, heard about Jesus. Everyone heard what, what Jesus was doing. He had already killed John by the time we come to this, this particular story, although this story tells us about the killing of John. He said, everyone heard what Jesus was doing, and he said, John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and mighty works are showing themselves forth through him. Herod understood. I mean, he knew for, the, for a fact that John the Baptist was a great man. He feared John the Baptist. He respected John the Baptist. And it frightened him to death because he was just as sure as he could be because of his guilty conscience that John the Baptist was coming back to haunt him. Others said, no, no, it's Elijah. And someone else said, it's a prophet or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, it is John whom I beheaded. He's risen from the dead. For Herod himself sent forth and laid hold on John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. And the politics. He'd married his brother's wife. I don't know all the circumstances. I just know that John had said to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. This is wrong. It shouldn't be. And I gather together, John probably said that publicly. Well, Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she couldn't. For Herod feared John, knowing he was a just man, holy, and observed him. And when he heard of him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Now, I, you, you can say some things about Herod, but it is fascinating that Herod recognized the greatness of John. He, not, he watched him carefully. He listened to what he had to say. He hung on his words, and he actually heard him gladly. He did not have a problem with John, even though John was telling him something he didn't want to hear. Herodias, she was another matter. When a convenient day was come, Herod on his birthday made a supper of his lords, high captains, chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said to the damsel, ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. And he swore to her, whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you under the half of my kingdom. Man, that was some dance. That is some girl. <laughs> and she went and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And her mother said, the head of John the Baptist. She came in immediately with haste to the king and said, I will that you give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry. Problem was, in the presence of a whole bunch of important people, he'd given his word. He had nowhere to go. So, immediately... He sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And the disciples of John came and took up his body and laid it in the tomb. So the greatest man ever born of women was not indispensable. You know, he was here today, he was gone tomorrow, and the dance of a little cutie brought him low. Not from his doing, but because he was doing his duty 
and was responsible. John was not the indispensable man, and he knew it. He had no question about it himself. John 3, verse 35. There arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. So they came to John, they said to him, Rabbi, he that was with you beyond Jordan, to whom you bear witness, behold, the same baptizes, and all men are flocking to him. Now this is a, uh, this is a, a normal, very natural kind of reaction in a community where, where, where the people are, have a common faith and a common belief, and one man begins to gather more disciples than another. You know, and when the disciples of man A are beginning to leave and go to the disciples of man B, jealousy is a very natural thing. And the concern for the loss of influence is a very natural thing. So they came to John and said, look, look, everybody's going over there to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it's given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness. You just bore witness. You told me when I said, I am not the Christ that I went before him. I'm sent before him. So you testify, don't you, that I'm not the Christ? You know it. He that has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom which stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Jesus is the bridegroom. I'm just his friend. And I stand by to one side, and as the bride goes to him, I rejoice. This is John's analogy. I'm not jealous of what's going on. He must increase I must decrease. This is truly a great man. For the man to be able to do that, to be able to do his job and then step out of the limelight and see Christ go forward. And yet he didn't stop preaching. He continued preaching because he got killed after this. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that comes from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He that comes from heaven is is above all. Where did John think Jesus came from? Obvious where he came from. What he has seen and heard that he testifies, no man receives his testimony, and he that receives his testimony has set his seal that God is true. The one that believes the testimony is the one he set his seal. He said, yes, I agree. I seal it. God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives not the spirit by measure to him. He's talking about Jesus. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. He that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John's a great man. He's going to be someone you'll want to meet when you get the chance someday. But he was not the indispensable man. It was Jesus, he said, who was indispensable. Apart from Jesus, probably the most influential writer in the Bible is none other than Paul. But Paul knew better than anyone that he was not the indispensable man. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, Paul said, I don't have anything to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Someone put on the forum a notice the other day about a book by Max Lucado where he, he, he imagined Jesus making the, the decision to leave home and to begin his ministry and how he walked into his shop and looked around at his carpentry tools that were there and had to realize what he was leaving and behind as though he had some, he had a decision to make. You know, I've got to leave all this. I'll never come back here again. I've got, to go and I have to face all these terrible things that lie out there ahead of me and so forth. And it was as though it was somehow he implied a struggle for Jesus as he left home. I don't believe that for a minute, not for a split second. It was no struggle for him. He knew where he was going. He knew he had to go there. And I don't think he ever stopped for a moment. He probably did not even go by the shop to look at his tools, if we want to use that analogy. He had work to do, and once the trigger was pulled, once the day had passed, once the moment has come, Jesus had no place to look but forward and no desire to do anything except what God had called him to do. And this is the same spirit you see in the Apostle Paul. He says, don't make any mistake about this. There's nobody any reason to pat me on the back. I have no choice. I have been called. God has sent me. 
I have to go. He never gave it a second thought. And you know, I, not to pat myself on the back in any way at all, but I know exactly what he's talking about. For when you know that you have been called of God, when you know that God has given you certain gifts, there comes a point in time where you may, as human beings, struggle over it a little bit, but you have no choice. I know I've had to struggle. There were times when I did not know. I was, I was puzzled. I was confounded by the situation I faced. But I was never confounded about what God expected me to do because I knew that he had called me. I know that he has given me certain gifts, and I know he holds me accountable for using those gifts. So here I am. I understand what Paul is saying. It's woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. I'm going to be in a whole heap of trouble if I don't get out there and do what it is I've been given to do. So please understand, Paul says. But he's one, he went on to say that if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. If against my will, well, <laughs> a job is preaching the gospel is given to me. I have to go do it whether I like it or not. So he had to find a way to go above and beyond his requirement. What's my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet I have made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. It's a staggering concept, he said. I am free from all men, but I have voluntarily made myself the servant of everybody so that I might gain the more. Gain the more what? Well, let's go forward. He says, To the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them who are without the law as without law. But I want you to understand, he clarifies, I'm not without law to God. I'm under the law to Christ. He does what he's trying to deal with here is realization is, I'm all things to all men. If I'm going to talk to you, I've got to talk to you where you are, not where I am. I've got to sit down with you if you're a truck driver at a truck stop somewhere along that long I-40, and we sit down to talk. I've got to talk with you there. I can't drag you into my pastoral office somewhere and expect you to come there and we talk to you there. And I've got to understand who you are from in your life, in the things that you go to. I've got to talk to you in your culture, in your language. All these things are important in conveying the gospel. For God speaks to us in our language, in our culture, and he doesn't ask us to try to figure something out from some totally foreign culture to us. He wants us to know him. And that's why he does it this way. And that's why Paul did all the things that he did. He said, when I was among the Jews, I talked to them as a Jew. When I'm among the Gentiles, I talked to them as a Gentile. And so on. To the weak, I became as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And I know people who would go right up the wall at that kind of a statement. Because they would say, you can't save anybody, only Christ can save. Oh, we know that. Paul knows that. And we also know what Paul is talking about. What Paul is saying is, I know that what I do makes a difference. This is not just one through the motions. What I do makes a difference. If it doesn't make any difference, there is no point in making all these sacrifices that I make. There is no point in doing what I do if it doesn't make a difference. So the way I treat people... The way I interact with people makes a difference in the outcome. And what is the outcome? That they might be saved. You know, I think we need to understand sometimes that we are really accountable for how we behave in the world because we who bear the, you know, the vessels of the Lord, as it were, we who carry his word around have got to mind our P's and Q's because just as we might be able by setting a good example and by presenting the word to someone, save them, we may also by our example cause them to stumble and to fall, and to be snared. So it's important. What we do, how we live, how we carry the gospel makes a difference. Don't ever let yourself forget that. This I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker with you. It implies, hey, if, if you don't make it, I may not make it. Then he goes on to say, don't you know that they which run in a race all run, but only one gets the prize? Well, Run. So you may obtain. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown. We, an incorruptible crown. Now, take me, he says. I run, not uncertainly. I fight, not as one that shadow boxes. I keep under my body. I bring it in subjection, lest that by any means, after I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 
If Paul said that, if it's true, Paul, then how much more is it of you and me? If it was possible, having preached to others, being responsible for the salvation of other, pe other people, that we ourselves could fall and be lost and lose everything because we have not kept our nose to the grindstone like as God said we should. Paul says, I am not the indispensable man. I am here. I have a job, but I will not necessarily be here tomorrow. He could change the lives of thousands. In fact, in Paul's case, it's probably millions because of the work he has done down through 2,000 years. He could still lose his own soul. In the last letter of his life, Paul brings a lot of stuff into perspective. So I'd like for you to turn back with me to one of my favorite books of the Bible, 2 Timothy. Because this is a man who early in his life was hard to live with. He was a very difficult man, a uh, prickly man, argumentative man, troublesome man. Uh, Mark finally got to the place where he turned and went back home. He, he got so discouraged with, I don't know with who or with what, but he finally gave up and went back home because, I don't know, of Paul perhaps? Because when Barnabas later wanted to take him along with him, Paul says, no way are we going to allow Mark to come with us. And they disputed it to such an extent that Paul and Barnabas split up over it. And I really don't believe that Barnabas was such a uh, di difficult person that he's the reason why they split up. The difficult person was none other than Saul of Tarsus. He was a hard man, difficult man. But now we've come to the end of his life. He's in prison. And he knows. I don't know how he knows, but he knows this is it. He'd been in prison before, and he'd gotten out. But this time, he knows it's different. And he writes to Timothy, I guess the person who meant more to him than any other person he had ever been with, worked with, as far as, you know, human beings were concerned. He wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So don't you be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but you be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Timothy probably wasn't afraid, but one of the things that concerned Paul was that they put, they put him in a slammer, he had a death sentence, and it put it pretty well sure to him and everybody else that it was going through this time. His concern was that because of this, it would cast a pall of fear on the church broad, far and wide. You think about this. The death of Paul? The death of this great leader of the church, the one who had gone through this whole part of the world and, 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 and created who knows how many disciples and seen to their baptism and that they were in the faith and so forth? This man now is in prison, going to death. It would cast a pall over the whole church. It would generate fear far and wide, and it probably might have, at least Paul thought it might, have made Timothy afraid. And that's why he said, don't be ashamed of me, the testimony of our Lord, or me, his prisoner. Don't worry about that. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind who has saved us, verse 9, has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Now, I, I, I'm one who could never tell you that I have a real good grip on God's purpose in the details. I have a broad idea of it. When we get down to the details of who's doing what to whom and when and where, I have no idea what he's doing. But I do know he has a purpose. I'm confident in that. Also know that our calling is also according to his grace. For there is no person who could step out to do a work for God. There is no person who could serve him who is not in need of his grace, who does not depend upon his grace. For if it were not for that grace, none of us could ever do anything for him. We could not represent him. We could not speak for him. We could not stand up and speak his word in public if it were not for his grace, which he gives us. It was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. And it's for this reason I suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. What had Paul committed to God against that day? Well, himself, of course, obviously, his life. I think he probably also committed his work. Because goodness knows, I mean, this man did work, didn't he? 
the work that he has done, you hold in your lap there. And of course, this man has been, you know, it's funny, I taught the epistles of Paul for seven years in the college in England. I don't know how many people, kids have come along and told me in later years that of all the courses they ever took, the one that was life-changing was the course in the epistles of Paul. To, in the course of a year, go all the way through, verse by verse, Paul's epistles, reading his letters, talking about his letters, understanding this great man, this was the thing which probably did more to convert them, to change them, than anything else they had ever experienced in time. That's what, what Paul committed. And he says, I am persuaded he is able to keep what I have committed to him against that day. Now hold fast the form of sound words which you have heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That word to Timothy is one that rings down through the generations to us. It rings in my ears. Hold fast the form of sound words because there sure are a whole bunch of unsound words floating around the landscape. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard of me among many witnesses, I want you to commit them to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And here's another one that rings down through the generations to us today. The things that you have taught in Christ Jesus, the thing that you have heard from Paul, from preachers that came before you, commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And Paul knew, as most of us who are in this work know, it's not so easy to find faithful men who will absorb the word, who will drink in the word, who will make the word as much a part of them as their own skin, their own flesh, who will be faithful with it and be truthful with it. So he says to Timothy in verse 3, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life because he wants to please himself, the man who has chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man is going to strive for the masteries, you're not going to have any crown. You're not going to get any medals unless you strive according to the rules. The husband that labors must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer even to jail, but the word of God is not bound. You just can't put the Bible in jail, folks. You can put a man who's preaching it in jail, but it's not going to stay there. And whatever it is that happens along the way, the men are one thing, but there is no indispensable man because the word of God cannot be bound, nor can it be buried in a grave somewhere. It is going to continue. Why? Because faithful men who have it are going to keep it and they're going to pass it on. He says, therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It's a faithful saying. If we are dead with him, we will also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. It's an interesting warning come in the middle of all this. And I have, to, I have to think when I hear Paul say this that there were those in that time who had done so. God knows there was plenty of temptation to deny him. There was plenty of reason to deny him. This was no easy time to confess Christ in this world. It could cost you your life in certain circumstances. And he says if we deny him, he will deny us. If we believe not, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Don't let them forget these things, Timothy. Put them in remembrance. Charge them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. You know, these words and proof texts and sentences and all this kind of stuff, they're not going to take you anywhere. What you've got to look at is, this, is, is the picture, the story, the indispensable man who is Jesus Christ. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that no, needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Shun profane and vain babblings, they will increase to more ungodliness. Their word will eat like a cancer, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already. I mean, when you talk about stupid, this was a stupid idea. And you wonder where in the world it comes from. You know, how in the world anyone could say the resurrection is come and gone? What do you mean it's come and gone? The only one that had ever been raised from the dead, apart from Lazarus, which was temporary, was Jesus Christ. Anyway, I don't know what these people were saying. 
He says, the foundation of God stands sure, having the seal. The Lord knows them that are his. And let every man that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In every great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man purge himself from these, he can be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared for every good work. Boy, he's talking about the cleaning up of the life. He's talking about cutting out, purging out of your life the things that don't need to be there so that you can be a vessel to honor, fit for the master's use, and prepared to every good work. Flee also youthful lusts. Follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Look, stay away from these foolish and unlearned questions. All they do is just gender arguments. Do I hear an amen? Do we know that that is true? These foolish and unlearned questions are just gender strife, 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 strife. Leave them alone. Forget about them. They're not to be meddled with. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. And folks, there was some time ago when I don't know why it was that all of a sudden that came down on me like a ton of bricks and I realized there's a mistake you have been making. Quit. Stop it. The servant of the Lord must not strive. So I don't get involved in certain kinds of theological debates anymore. I have a forum on the Internet, and when they go a certain direction, I just cut it off. I can do that. I am the supreme moderator on my forum. <laughs> I'm just doing what the Lord said. Foolish and unlearned questions. Avoid, knowing that they just gender strife, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men. I cut them off gently. Apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves. If peradventure, he says maybe, that's an interesting word, peradventure, he will give them repentance to the knowledge, acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of devil who are, ta are taken captive at his will. And, you know, I know a lot of people who are, are really in that category of being captives, you know, who are in the snare of the devil. But he says they can be recovered out of that. But you don't recover them out of that by arguing with them. You don't recover them out of that by proof texting with them or by beating them over the head or by, uh, you know, getting bitter with them. You got to maintain contact. You got to stay in touch. You got to be gentle, but you got to lead and draw and ask and inquire. And just maybe if we're patient, God will help some people recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Chapter three. This know also, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. I wonder about this. Weren't people like this in that day? I would have thought probably these are pretty normal human characteristics in a society. But I'm gathering from this that Paul is suggesting no, no, it's, it's, this is not that big a deal now because he says it's in the last days it's going to be this way. They're going to be without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, haters of, of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God who have a form of godliness. Oh, my. We're not talking about atheists or agnostics here. We're talking about people who have a form of godliness. And yet they meet the criterion that he says, this is what we're going to see as we come down toward the time of the end. Now, sure, in Paul's day, there were people who hated their parents. Sure, there was all this type of thing. But what he's talking about is people who have a form of godliness who do these things. And that is something we are beginning to see in our generation. They have a form of godliness. They deny the power thereof, turn away from people like this. Of this sort are they that creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with lusts, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 12. <clears throat> yea, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Count on it. You know, don't imagine this is not going to happen. It's going to happen. But continue in the things that you have learned and have been assured of, 
knowing of whom you have learned them, and that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And I can't help but noticing the only scriptures that he knew from a child were what you and I call the Old Testament, which were able to make him wise to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be proficient, thoroughly equipped unto all good works. And then his last chapter, chapter 4. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Don't let up. Stay on these people. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. After their own lust, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. No, hear an amen? Did you ever stand in front of those maps with a bright big red arrow that says you are here that's where we are they will not endure sound doctrine after their own lust they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears they'll turn away their ears from the truth and be turned to fables you are here that's the way I feel when I read this passage but watch in all things endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist make full proof of your ministry for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good faith, a fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Wow, well, don't you want to be able to say that as you get down toward the end of the line? To be able to say, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. You're not saying you never did anything wrong because Paul knew very painfully and very painfully that he had done things wrong. But what he says is, I have kept the faith. From now on, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. Which isn't everybody, by the way. Not everyone's going to be happy when they see Jesus Christ coming back. But those who will, will have a crown. When I look in the mirror to shave every morning, I do not see the indispensable man. What I see is a flawed and aging human being. But I know that if I can cause people to hear and understand God's word, and in particular, if I can cause them to hear and understand the words of Jesus, then even I can make a difference. This was the thing Paul lived for, was to make a difference. And I know that I can make a difference. Jeremiah had this curious thing to say in, in, in of all the most curious places in a chapter dealing with false prophets. And he says in chapter 23, verse 18, Jeremiah 23, verse 18, Who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and perceived and heard his word? Who has marked his word and heard it? Now, by marked, he means taken special note of it, but I take it another way in a sense. I have marked my Bibles down through the years and still do. Who has marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not return until he has executed, till he has performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will finally understand this scripture. You'll understand it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, but they prophesied. But then he says this, But if they had stood in my counsel, if they had caused my people to hear my words, then they could have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Am I a God at hand, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Now, I will tell you, frankly, God has never spoken to me personally. I am no prophet, true or false, but I can read the prophets. And I can cause people to understand the prophets. And because a lot of you people support me in this, I want you to know I can do it on a, a broader forum than I could do any other way. Believe me, it is worth doing. Because in so doing, we can turn people from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. I need your help. I need your prayers. I need your support. 
and we will run this race as our bodies allow, always a step behind the truly indispensable man.